Good morning. I'm Representative Dave Pinto, and I'm calling this meeting of the House Early Childhood Finance and Policy Committee to order. I'm the chair of the committee. Uh, welcome to members of the public. You'll find information about uh, our committee and the agenda and meeting materials, et cetera, on our committee website. Um, this meeting is being held pursuant to House Rule 10.01, which allows for virtual meetings of this type. Um, I think that's all the initial business. So I'm going to ask uh, the clerk, Mr. Dozling, to please take the roll. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Representative Pinto, Chair. Present. Representative Pryor, Vice Chair. Present. Lead Franzen. Present. Representative Bennett. Present. Representative Bolden. Present. Representative Daniels. Present. Representative Daphne. Present. Representative Damoth. Present. Representative Jurgens. Jurgens, present. Representative Cotiza Watoon. Present. Representative Morrison. Morrison, present. Representative Waslowick. Present. And Representative Volgamot. Volgamot, present. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you, uh, Mr. Doslin, and thanks all. Um, next order of business is to uh, uh, approve our minutes from our most recent meeting on March 3rd. So, Representative Pryor, if I can ask you to move approval of those minutes. So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And so, uh, uh, any additions or corrections, members, to the minutes? So, hearing none, all in favor of approval of the minutes from March 3rd, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so our minutes are adopted. That motion passed. Um, and so, we, members, we have a few bills to make our way through today. The first is um, from Representative Pryor, and it's the one that we heard last Thursday relating to school aged care, House File 3485. You'll recall that uh, there was an amendment that needed to be made, and so we had to bring it back to deal with that amendment and then um, uh, uh, hopefully pass it on. So, uh, Representative Pryor, uh, would you like to move to uh, refer House File 3485 to uh, the Committee on Education and Finance? Yes, Mr. Chair, that is my motion. Okay, thank you, Representative Pryor. Um, and then um, you have the A2 amendment, is that correct? That's correct. Oh, okay, Representative Pryor, can you just tell us um, uh, what that does since we, since we had a bit of a delay over it? We, I want to especially just get a sense as to what the, what the deal is with it. Okay, great. Um, well, let me first say that this amendment is a result of work by the Minnesota Child Care Association and the Minnesota Community Education Association. And what we wanted to do is address concerns um, and also acknowledge that there still are concerns moving forward. We're going to keep working to clarify the language. And so I can go on and describe a little bit about what's going on with this amendment. Um, and you know, Reverend Pryor, right? you know, we, it is. And you know, we might do actually, if you can, I don't want to take too long on this, but if you can just give, give us an incentive to remind us um, about what the bill does. Um, <laughs> since it's, uh, we did have a we did have a discussion on Thursday. So, uh, but just for folks who may not, members of the public who may not have been with us. Well, um, the the nuts and bolts of the bill is that. Uh, we have programs right now in the state that are school that are in schools, um, and uh, these programs also offer after school care. So whatever you call it, um, it's also it, it it's into that area of it's not strictly speaking the preschool day, but it's um, um, time after that because parents are not arriving at school, picking up their children and taking them someplace else. It's a continuation of the child's school um, of time spent at school for the children. Uh, but we also know, uh, particularly it's clear after the, um, the pandemic and all that's meant to our youngest uh, students is that um, some kids are struggling right now and they need some additional support when they're in the school um, after their regular uh, preschool programs have ended. And um, this, this bill would allow school districts, um, would give funding so that school districts can fund this um, additional supports um, that are needed. So that's that's what the uh, the bill is doing, and we wanted to have more clarification so that it's clear that we're focusing on this additional support um, that students um, are going to be needing, or that there would be funding to have this additional support. And I can describe the amendment. Yeah, please, and then and then please describe the amendment. And then members then will have questions, and I, I anticipate we'll we'll go straight to a, a vote. But um, uh, after your questions, but Representative Pryor, yeah, please then explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
So under current law, a school aged care program can receive revenue to provide additional services to children with disabilities or children experiencing temporary family or related problems. The intent was for House File 3485 um, the intent was to allow school districts to access this revenue to provide additional services to students in school districts, pre-K or licensed child care program, and to expand school age care programs from grade six to grade eight. There were, there, there were concerns that the bill was drafted too broadly, so the A2 amendment was drafted to better reflect the intent. This amendment clarifies that a school district community education program can provide wraparound services to students enrolled in a school district pre-K or licensed child care program and access the levy to provide additional services for children with disabilities or children experiencing temporary family or related problems. Okay, thank you. So members, I'm inclined to just have questions on both the bill and the amendment and then, and then I would anticipate we hopefully pass the amendment and get the, the bill in the form of prior wishes and then, and then have a roll call vote on the bill itself. So any questions members on the member of the bill? Give just a minute on that. And then again, this bill will go to education and finance. So I'm not seeing any hands. So um, so Representative Fryer had moved the A2 amendment. So we'll deal with that first to get the bill the form she wishes. So, um, uh, and we've been doing uh, these author, author amendment with voice votes. Um, so all in favor of approval of the A2 amendment, um, please say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? No. Okay, um, so uh, the A2 amendment passes, so the bill is in the form of prior wishes. And then any final questions, members, on the bill itself? I'm just looking to see. I am. Not seeing it. Oh, Representative, uh, Representative Francis, I'm sorry. Sorry, yeah. Zoom does not allow for a quick raising of hands. Mr. Yeah, no problem. No, that's okay, I, Representative, Representative Francis. Would Representative Pryor yield to a question? <laughs> I'm sure she will, yeah, okay. Representative Francis. So my question, Representative Pryor, is, in my opinion, this bill directly competes with the private sector of child care providers. So do you see any ramifications of, you know, of, uh, I know that this is for if, oh, so what if, what if a child is not enrolled in, let's say, a program at the school, like a voluntary pre-kindergarten program? Could they utilize the um, could they utilize the preschool care throughout the entire day? So my concern is that we're going to push more people into the public government programs, and we're going to create more issues with the private sector. As you know, they're already struggling, and when you remove the preschool kids from the private homes, they are unable to, they can't make sense of it financially. A business cannot run on just preschools, I'm sorry, on toddlers and infants. They need that preschool age group in order to make their, their business, um, you know, work. So I'm just kind of curious how you see this bill working with or against the, the government or the, you know, the private sector. Representative Pryor. Um, well, first of all, I'm going to say this really sincerely. I'm I'm really glad that you asked that press with that question, Representative Franton, because I think there are some people that saw the bill and that was their concern. And um, the original draft of the bill, uh, I think, did not make that clear enough. And that is the amendment that we brought forward to make it clear that there these are this is about um, support services for the children that are enrolled, enrolled in those specific programs that we have right now in their, in their um, when they're still at school after, after that program is done. Um, and, but what I wanna do is um, also bring in, uh, uh, I, we have available for, for our questions, Mr. Chair, Wendy Webster, who's the Director of Community Education, um, also um, understands how these programs function and um, can you know be be the uh, the testifier for this this question too, which is I'm, as I said before, a very good question that we do want to clarify. I'm so I'll send it back to Representative Franson if she wants, or, or I can send it to Ms. Webster, or Representative Franson, if that's. I, I do think the purpose of the A2 was actually to address this very concern that you've raised, Representative Franson. Maybe um, do you mind? We'll send it to Ms. Webster if that's okay with you, Representative Franson. You're the chair. Okay. 
Oh, I just want to make sure you, you get an answer to your question. So, well, no, um, I still want to oh. continue on with Representative Pryor, but we can move on no. to Ms. Webster first. Yeah, let's do that. So, Ms. Webster, if you can please identify yourself, um, and then if you can uh, address Representative Franson's question. Um, Chair Pinto, thank you. Uh, Representative Franson, thank you for this question. And yesterday we had a chance to meet with the Minnesota Child Care Association uh, to address some of these concerns. What we know in Minnesota is there's not enough slots for kiddos birth to age five in general. And so school districts have, uh, in some cases, tried to fill that need in communities where there's not slots for kids ages three, four, and five. And so what we see at, at this point, um, not this funding would not be in direct competition with our private providers, who in most communities we partner very closely with, especially when parents uh, approach us and are looking for child care options. And if we know our program or other programs are full, we seek out other options for families. But our purpose of this is when a child is participating in a, a preschool program, uh, either a full day program or, uh, for example, um, some of the services that they may be provided through early childhood special ed. They may, for example, here in St. Anthony, we have an all day preschool program and, and children who receive early childhood special education services have to leave our site to go receive their services and then come back. And so the supports are provided when they're at their program. Those supports aren't provided here on site. And so looking at how we could utilize these funds, which are currently available for children who are in kindergarten through sixth grade, how we can use them to uh, provide some additional supports to help our preschool students be successful and to make sure that their experience is a positive one. So Representative Franson. Right, I just think that the amendment should be a little bit more clear. So what Representative Pryor said, I would like to, that to be more clear that it's not in direct competition with the private sector, I still think it leads for that. I mean, when I read the amendment, that's that's what I'm thinking. It still misses the mark. So I think there still needs to be some work done on there. Government should not be competing with the private sector. We're only going to create more problems down the road unless this direct competition ends. Okay, thank you, Representative France. And Representative Pryor, did you have something more to address on, on this on this point? Just I, I to, tell. Okay. Uh, really, sir, Representative Franson, that that was the intent of the uh, amendment is to direct um, the, um, you know, the, to make it, to, to clarify again, that we're talking about children that need this additional support. And that's what the revenue is going towards. So instead of, as uh, Ms. Webster explained, instead of having to leave the building for the support, they, that, that, um, that uh, essentially special education support can, um, can be um, uh, offered on site in the same school building. So we're talking about um, you know, this group of children um, and this in that age group of three and four year olds that that do need the special education and these special supports. So um, I and um, you know, the, and that's certainly what what's been what we've been working on since the bill was first introduced with the Minnesota Child Care Association um, to make sure that that was being clarified in the amendment. Thanks. Looks like Representative Franson. Thank you. It looks like Representative Franson has something more. Please, if you do, uh, could those children be there the entire day without utilizing any of the programs. They're just there for, they're just there. I don't know, uh, Representative Pryor, I'm not sure what they'd be doing there. Uh, if, right, so if they're, if, not a, if they're not involved in a voluntary pre-kindergarten program, could they be there for their preschool care? Mm -hmm. All day. A representative Pryor? I'm not sure that there would be another program that, but I'm um, Representative Pryor, do you? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so that now the amendment does spell out the reasons the children would be in that uh, building, in that school facility. And it, um, it lists 
that it's because of um, uh, the voluntary pre-K or the uh, school readiness plus programs. So it specifies in the amendment um, the programs that the children would be at the school for. Um, and then afterwards, then we're talking about after that program has ended, this special education support that they would be receiving. So I think if I understand your question, could a parent just drop their kid, their child, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> their kiddo off at a school building and say, this I want to have my child, the daycare formed. And I, that's not what would be going on. I see Ms. Uh, Ms. Mock is, 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 has her camera on, which is usually a sign to me that um, she has something useful she wants to add. <laughs> I mean, I always want to have house research jump in if they have anything. Ms. Mock, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So under current law, um, a school district can offer a licensed child care program, and it can also offer a program to children 30 month, 33 months and older um, as a license exempt program. And so the schools that offer these programs are the schools that could then receive this additional funding for um, the portion of the day any kids are not in uh, pre-K or school readiness or another um, preschool program. So I think to Representative Franson's question, yes, the kids could be there for a licensed child care program or as part of this license exempt program if, if a school district is offering one of those. Thank you, Ms. Mock. That's helpful. And Representative Franson, uh, anything further from you at this point? Um, well, I believe that this will con be continued to be worked on. So that is that's a good sign. I think. Uh, Vice Chair Pryor for her willingness to continue moving the ball in the right direction on her on her bill. Thank you. Mr. Thank Chair, you, Representative. Oh, uh, Mr. Griffin, is that who I'm hearing? Yes, yes. Mr. Griffin. Thank you, yeah, Mr. I think, Chair. Um, I know my yeah. name says that I'm representing ARM today, but I also represent the <laughs> Minnesota Child Care <laughs> Association, and we appreciate Representative Franson's concerns. We have been talking with the author and the proponents of the bill and are comfortable with this language that it does not expand it to uh, the, reach the concerns that Representative Franson had, and uh, we are neutral once the bill's been uh, adopted with this amendment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Griffin. And, and it still sounds like, though, though there, there is more work that, that can be done to just make sure the language is just absolutely as tight as it can be. And so Representative Franson has highlighted that, and Representative Pryor sounds like you're, you're willing to continue working on that. Um, they will have another committee stop, um, so uh, we can do that. So I, I do want to move on very quickly. Representative Pryor will give you the final word, um, but if you <laughs> make it a quick word, that'd be good. <laughs> and just quick, so the bill's saying what exists already. It's talking about revenue um, that is needed right now uh, for the uh, that that some kids children need right now in their schools. So, um, but clarity and belt and suspenders are good. So um, we'll continue to work if that's still not clear right now. Please, please do, Representative Pryor. So, um, Representative Pryor renews her motion to refer uh, HF 3485 to Education Finance. And, Mr. Doslin, if you can please take the roll on the bill. And, pardon me, uh, HF 3485 as amended to Education Finance. Um, if you can please take the roll. Uh, Representative Pintel, Chair. Present. Or, <laughs> pardon me, I. <laughs> Pintel, I. <laughs> Representative Pryor, Vice Chair. I. Prior, I lead friends in. No. Friends in, no. Representative Bennett. No. Bennett, no. Representative Bolden. Bolden, I. Bolden, I. Representative Daniels. Daniels votes no. Daniels, no. Representative Daphne. Daphne, I. Daphne, I. Representative Damoth. Damoth, no. Damoth, no. Representative Jurgens. Jurgens, no. Jurgens, no. Representative Cotiza Watoon. Cotiza Watoon, aye. Cotiza Watoon, aye. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison, aye. Representative Waslowick. Waslowick, aye. Waslowick, aye. Representative Wolgamot. Wolgamot, aye. Wolgamot, aye. The vote results in eight ayes and five nays. Thank you, Mr. Doslin. So the motion passes uh, an H of 3485 as amended is on its way to education finance on Pitcher Devney's committee. Um, and thank you, Representative Pryor. Um, and thanks, Ms. Webster, for, uh, for being on to answer questions. Um, so members, um, next we have two bills um, that relate to uh, home visiting. And the plan for these bills is um, we're going to have, we're going to essentially be 
discussing them um, informationally initially, essentially what I want to do is to um, uh, move uh, and pass uh, both bills in succession, because as you'll see, they really cover the same territory. And so rather than having the one bill and a whole big discussion do that, and then the second bill, what we're going to do is have the bills be presented, and then we'll bring them up um, uh, one after another for a vote. Um, if members have questions about that, please raise your hand. Happy to to do that, um, but I, I hope it'll be clear as we go. So uh, those bills are HF 3886 and 3887. And again, we'll have the motions um, uh, uh, shortly, but for now, um, we'll have those bills um, each be brought before us um, informationally for the next you know, 20 minutes or so, um, uh, or a bit longer. So Representative Morrison, you're the author of both of these bills. Um, if you can describe them to us, uh, and uh, we'll move on to your testifiers and go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for explaining this somewhat unusual situation. Um, do you want me to move the author's amendments, or should we do that uh, after? I think that we should do, well, let me ask you, uh, Representative Morrison, are the author's amendments, um, uh, are they just technical fixes, or is there is there sort of more substance to, uh, uh, to either of them? No, they're correcting an oversight of a uh, list of provider and adding a, oh. a, a provider who um, can participate in the program. Oh, I forgot sure. about that. I, I forgot about that. <laughs> I was involved in that. So um, let's, I'm inclined to hold hold off on that. Uh, and uh, we'll have those at the end because the bills are not formally before us. So we'll do that at the end of the process as well. Okay. Thank you, Thanks. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to present House Files 3886, uh, which is a universal voluntary home visiting program, and House File 3887, which is the Minnesota Baby Steps Home Visiting Program, uh, which are very similar approaches to home visiting programs. The bills specifically call for home visiting services that provide a range of one to six visits that occur prenatally or within the first four months of the expected birth or adoption of an infant, and works to improve the outcomes in two or more areas, including maternal and newborn health, school readiness, family economic self-sufficiency, coordination re and referral for other community resources and supports, reduction in child injuries, abuse or neglect, or reduction in crime or domestic violence. The bill asks the Commissioner of Health to ensure that these voluntary home visiting services are available to all families residing in Minnesota by June 30th of 2025, prioritizing areas of high need with grants until the program is available statewide. Uh, the only difference between the bills is that one is an ongoing universal voluntary home visiting program and the other is a one time appropriation for the Minnesota Baby Steps program. Um, and as you will hear from our testifiers, family home visiting is a proven strategy to improve pregnancy and birth outcomes, address maternal and infant health needs, support development of secure attachment with children, address breastfeeding and feeding questions and concerns, and connect families to community resources to address the unique needs of each family. Many of you, of you are aware of the benefits of targeted family home visiting programs, but you may not know that short-term programs also have compelling benefits to families. Improved child health and development, including increased parent-child attachment and increased rates of kindergarten readiness. Improved maternal outcomes, such as decreases in maternal depression, increases in maternal employment and reductions in alcohol and drug use as well as decreases in child abuse and maltreatment and increased understanding of positive child development. Most families have been impacted by the pandemic. We know there are increased mental health needs of parents and children. We've seen increases in maternal death rates and increased developmental delays for babies and young children. Additionally, we know some families have been impacted through the loss of loved ones, the loss of employment, the loss of housing or experiencing challenges accessing healthy food. Minnesota has made important investments in voluntary home visiting services for pregnant women and families with young children. It's critical to provide all infants and their families access to resources early to connect them to the resources in their community that will help their family thrive. I hope that you will all join me in supporting voluntary home visiting so that Minnesota's families get off to the best possible start and have the information and access to resources they need to thrive. And with that, Mr. Chair, I will turn it over to our testifiers. Thank you, Representative, Representative Morrison. Um, so we have four folks, and I'm going to ask each of you, if you can, to, to, to please keep it um, pretty short, just two or three minutes. Um, uh, we've got Ms. Filbert uh, first, if you can identify yourself, and then please proceed to your with your testimony. 
Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Kathy Filbert and I am the co-chair of the Minnesota Coalition for Family Home Visiting and a manager of the Family Health Division at St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health and a former home visitor. The coalition represents a broad array of nonprofit organizations, local public health agencies, tribal health agencies, and local education home visiting programs. Prior to the pandemic, through targeted home visiting, there were approximately 10% of eligible families accessing these voluntary and stabilizing services. Unfortunately, we began to see families and children and other public health, public systems if they don't access the stabilizing supports through home visiting. In 2019, over 2,000 babies and toddlers and 1,500 young children were victims of maltreatment. Many of these children are removed from homes and placed in out-of-home placement. Unfortunately, too many children who enter the foster care system remain there, causing additional stress and trauma throughout their lives. Many of the families served by home visiting programs live in poverty, experience mental health issues, have housing and food instability, and experience chemical addiction or come from the foster care system. There are approximately 69,000 births in Minnesota annually, and by providing infants and families access to home visiting, this means we can help stabilize families and give them necessar a necessary boost of information and access to resources in just a few short visits. We have been seeing in the homes in our communities, families who have been delayed, who have delayed care with their providers during the pandemic. And as a result, infants and children are behind in their immunizations. Through a developmental screen we do in the homes, we offer this to families and we're finding children with social, emotional, and developmental delays, along with low hemoglobins, which are low blood counts, needing medical attention. And children are coming back with high lead levels as well. We are getting a number of referrals to help families assist them in monitoring blood pressures of pregnant women and those women who have recently delivered babies. The ability for the home visitor to help check in on a pregnant mom, <clears throat> excuse me, pregnant mom to assess and monitor blood pressure can be an immense help in preventing serious or even fatal complications for both mom and the baby. The same is true after delivery when the mothers return home and the home visitor has the knowledge, skills, and abilities to assess blood pressure, blood clots, postpartum depression, and connect them to their healthcare provider for further care. In addition, while they're in the home, they're also assessing the newborn for growth and development. And Ms. Fib Ms. Fibber, if I can ask you to, to wrap up um, yep. momentarily here, thank okay. you. Thank you, I'm happy to respond to any questions regarding this bill. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Ms. Fibber, thanks for being with us and for, for all of your work. Um, and it's great to have someone who worked <laughs> worked as a home visitor with us to kick us off for test fire. So thank you. I'm okay. Representative Ben, I see your, your hand is raised. I'm guessing it's to ask questions at the end, unless you have a clarifying question now. I, I can wait till the end, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Um, so next is um, um, uh, Ms. Muntefering. I hope I'm saying your last name correctly, but you'll correct me. Um, if you can please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Hello, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Claudia Montefering. I'm here today representing Minnesota Coalition for Family Home Visiting as a member of the Executive Committee. I'm a registered nurse, public health nurse, and a family home visitor. I have provided family home visitor over family home visiting services over the past 20 years in two separate counties and one tribal nation. As a family home visitor, we work to assist in the perinatal period, which includes the time during pregnancy in the first year postpartum. For some families, they choose to continue working with family home visitors and work with us for up to two or three years. Providing quality home visiting services in rural communities is essential as there are limited services that provide intensive supports to this targeted population. The mothers and families we work with deal with multiple issues such as mental health, substance abuse, isolation, and past trauma. We work hard to help stabilize families through 
home visiting prevention services and often see the best results when parents really engage with their home visitor. During my time as a family home visitor, I have been able to help mothers with transitional housing, permanent housing, referrals for chemical dependency and treatment, and I've also been able to place mothers in battered women's shelters. We know COVID has had a disproportionate impact on families. More families are facing housing and food instability and are feeling more isolated. Additional resources and attention to these families will be critical as we build back from the pandemic. Ultimately, we want to increase the access to these voluntary services to families that are interested and in increase family home visiting resources. Our goals are to empower mothers and families to support their child's cognitive development, improve health outcomes, and work towards self-sufficiency through education and employment. We know our home visiting program makes a positive in impact in the lives of families we serve as told by our nurses through numerous stories of helping mothers and families. In many instances, this is the first positive adult relationship that these mothers and families have had. We hope the legislature will continue to support funding for home visiting so that these programs can continue to impact healthy futures for families. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Montefiore, and thank you for your work. And next we have Dr. Dobrin. It's so nice to have you with the committee. Uh, doctor, if you can please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Oh, we need to get you unmuted. Working on that, there we go. Got Welcome. It. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Pinto, uh, Lee Franzen, Vice Chair Pryor. And uh, thank you, uh, Representative Morrison, for bringing these important bills uh, forward and uh, committee members. Uh, I'm Dale Dobrin. I've been a pediatrician in the western suburbs of Minneapolis uh, since uh, founding South Lake Pediatrics in 1974. Uh, well, up until uh, the start of the pandemic, when they said uh, it was too risky for a 70-some-year-old person to continue uh, seeing patients. So, uh, but I've uh, remained in touch with uh, what's going on at the clinic, and especially uh, with the uh, uh, matter of uh, early childhood uh, initiatives. Uh, I'm a member of the Minnesota chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, Early Childhood Work Group. And I'll just mention uh, quickly that the uh, uh, Minnesota chapter has elevated early childhood initiatives to one of their top three priorities for the next three years. Uh, I've submitted documents for the committee's review, including an important paper from 2017 by the Academy of Pediatrics that goes into uh, detail uh, is a, and is a comprehensive review of the literature. And I've excerpted uh, parts of that and put it in the uh, documents for your review. I'll, I'll try to be brief, which uh, I'll just say right off the top has uh, generally not been easy for me, but uh, you're, you're, about, you're, about, you're about halfway through, Dr. Dobrin, so. <laughs> yeah, I was afraid of that. Uh, yeah. So I'll try to highlight a couple of things. The Affordable Care Act of 2009 specifically funded evaluation and evidence of effectiveness studies, so-called Home V, which have done much to confirm the effectiveness application and implementation of home visiting programs. Uh, the War on Poverty in the 1960s identified uh, uh, poverty as the main driver of disease and family disruption in low-income families. And for context, as, as was mentioned, there are nearly 70,000 births in Minnesota each year, uh, and nearly 50% of those are uh, uh, mothers are covered by Medicaid or, um, in uh, Minnesota's case, uh, medical assistance. Uh, in the U.S., 20% of children live in homes where incomes are at or below the federal uh, poverty guideline, and 40% live at or below 200%, which uh, the studies indicate corresponds to li living in poverty. So I'd like to conclude with a few points. The studies I referred to all confirm the elements of uh, Representative Morrison's bills. Home, second, home visiting for early support, identification, intervention, critically important for babies' brains developing during the key period uh, of the first thousand days. During this time, babies' brains are uniquely susceptible and vulnerable to chronic toxic stress, of which the ills of poverty are the greatest contributors. And Dr. Dobrin, I'll, I'll have to have you wrap up, I'm afraid, <laughs> red, okay. red time. All right. Um, 
So uh, I will say just a, a couple of follows. At least 20% of mothers experience serious mood disorders in the months following a baby's birth, social and emotional, social and physical isolation of the driving factors, social interactions such as home visiting, mitigate against the anxiety and depression for mother and baby, and early screening identification uh, provide Thank you. resources. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Dobrin, and thanks thanks for all of your work. I really appreciate you being with us and, and for everything that you're that you're doing. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, we next have Dr. Uh, we have uh, 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 Carrie Sawyer, uh, Ms. Sawyer. I may, may not pronounce your first name correctly, but if you can please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Yep, and it's Kari, so thank you. Yep. Oh, Kari, okay. um, thank you, Ms. Sawyer, yep. <laughs> please. Yep, uh, my name is Kari Sawyer. I am a licensed parent and family educator uh, th with 13 years of experience working with children and families and for the past seven years overseeing an ECFE home visiting program in the metro area. I'm here specifically to speak on the value and history of ECFE as a universal access home visiting service. Um, the home visiting aspect of ECFE began receiving funding in 1992, but home visiting has been implemented by ECFE since the pilot programs in the mid 1970s. Um, per Minnesota state statute, ECFE home visiting is intended to reach isolated or at-risk families as a priority. Our home visiting programs incorporate evidence-informed parenting education practices and are facilitated by qualified and trained ECF ECFE staff. Um, clear objectives and protocols are established for visits. Families are encouraged to make a transition from home visits to site-based programs. And ECFE home visits provide program services that are community-based, accessible, culturally relevant, and foster collaboration among existing agencies and community-based organizations that serve families with young children, including connections to early childhood screening. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, many visits have been able to be carried out via phone or virtually, and through ECFE home visiting programs, many community partnerships have been built up with two-way referral systems. So these partnerships include clinics, hospitals, and other community early childhood programs. Um, agencies refer families to ECFE, and we're either able to serve the families referred to us or refer them to other programs and agencies to meet their needs. Um, and some staff in districts conduct postpartum hospital visits, which during these visits that families are offered ECFE home visits, community resources, and information about ECFE classes. Um, ECFE is a logical partner for universal home visiting in Minnesota, and we support HF3886 and HF3887 because it helps every child and family get a strong start. So thank you for your time and your support for universal home visiting. Chair Pinto, you're muted. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Cindy. Um, so I was just thanking you, Ms. Sawyer, for uh, for your testimony and for all of your work. Um, and uh, we do have a uh, public public testifier, Kelly Chandler. If you can please identify yourself um, and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kelly Chandler. I'm from Itasca County, where I, I serve as the public health division manager. I've worked there for over 21 years. I'm also a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner working with children and families, and I am a previous home visiting public health nurse. I'm representing the Local Public Health Association or LPHA of Minnesota, and I'm testifying in support of House File 3886, which would establish the Universal Voluntary Home Visiting Program for families of new babies and support the amendment that includes local public health nurses in the definition of individuals who may administer the programs. And we do thank you, Mr. Chair Pinto and members of this committee for hearing this legislation and Representative Morrison for her leadership on this issue. The first three years of a child's life are when 85% of brain growth occurs and children who meet physical and cognitive benchmarks are more prepared for school. They have stronger relationships and have healthier and more stable lives. Services are provided where families are most comfortable in their home Trained professionals provide the tools to support families and support their child's physical and emotional health and development. It prevents child maltreatment and does foster family self-sufficiency among Minnesota's most at-risk families. All of these which reduce long-term health and public health program costs. And I'm going to share two stories from Itasca County. Both of these were from our last year of home visiting. Public health nurse saw a family, had a 10 month old and a 30 month old. It was the final visit um, and ending services and the parents started listing these concerns about their 30 month old who was regressing in speech, having some unusual emotional reactions. And the public health nurse was able to make an early intervention referral to help me grow 
for the family to ensure the child was evaluated further and access services prior to their entry into school. Second story, public health nurse saw mom with a five month old. Mom had a history of depression and anxiety. She was very proactive with managing the symptoms with medication with her OB provider. But after her postpartum period was over, she didn't have a mental health provider to continue the medication management. She lost services with her mental health providers due to the COVID challenges. Mom was overwhelmed. She was back to work full time. She didn't know where to start. Her depression and anxiety were worsening. Public health nurse and mom discussed the options. And really what mom wanted was to reconnect with her mental health providers. Public health nurse made that connection and the mom was able to be seen the next day. And we're over two months later and mom is still connected with her mental health providers. These are just two of the stories about the positive impacts of universal voluntary home visiting programs in Minnesota. LPHA urges you to support House File 3886 and the amendment that will include local public health nurses to provide the services. Thank you for your consideration and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Chandler. Thanks for being with us and for your important work um, in Itasca County. Um, so uh, we'll move to member questions. Um, I'll just remind members as we do that the administration has a proposal for voluntary home visiting as well. I'm gonna ask Ms. Mock uh, shortly to, to uh, just provide a comparison of, of that uh, with, with these, but I um, wanna get to member questions in the meantime. Uh, Representative Bennett has been quite patient. So Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I have two questions, if that's okay, but I'll just ask them one at a time. Uh, yeah. My first question is, um, does this program target vulnerable families or is it just blanket all families? Can someone answer? Yeah, right we'll go to Representative, yeah, we'll go to the bill's author, Representative Morrison, to, to take the first cut. She can send it any direction she wants. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Bennett. The bills are written uh, to be offered to all Minnesotans. So the average of 69,000 births a year in our state, uh, it is uh, considered a universal program and voluntary offered to all. During the implementation of the program, there will, until it is up and running fully, there will be uh, grants available to targeted um, high need communities. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Morrison. Um, my second question is a little broader, and it might be for Representative Morrison or maybe others um, on here, testifiers, but I'm just curious what current programs we have for home visiting and, uh, excuse me, and how they um, perhaps overlap with this program. I have the current programs for home visiting, because I do think it's an important um, it's an important issue that we need for, especially these targeted families, vulnerable families. But anyway, they they overlap with this. Have they been evaluated to see which ones are the most effective? Um, how do they overlap with this new program? And maybe sort of two questions there about the overlap and then also the valuation of this program, since I was hearing that representative. Thanks, yeah. So um, yeah, and I, and I think great answers to both of them. I'm a, so Representative Morrison, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the great questions, Representative Bennett. Um, this program is uh, short-term, prenatal, um, through the first four months of life, um, and then with sort of a bridge to longer-term home visiting programs. For a, To flesh out what's currently available and what we know about it, I could perhaps ask Ms. Mock to, to uh, give us more information about that, but that's the intent of, of this program. Yeah, and well, well, let's get to that. And I do want to also talk about the evaluation question Representative Bennett asked. I know there's been a lot of evaluation, but Ms. Mock, if you can comment, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so currently there are several home visiting programs um, funded by the state and the state also receives federal money for some home visiting programs. Uh, none of those programs is set up as a universal program so that all um, individuals in the state have access to the programs. Um, and many of the programs um, do not have this uh, short-term focus on uh, prenatal and the first few months of an infant's life. They are longer-term programs that, um, that uh, where the, the home visitors stay with the family for one to two years um, until the child is a little bit older. And uh, um, to speak to the evaluation portion, I am not aware of any evaluations that have been done, but I can certainly reach out to MDH and see what they have on that topic. 
Uh, well, um, well, Representative Bennett, we'll go back to you. I'll have a question about evaluation, but Representative Bennett, you have the floor, so please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll, I guess I'll just make a comment as, um, first of all, as I said before, I, I believe that home visiting is very important for our targeted vulnerable families. I, I am concerned that this is more of a shotgun effect that goes out to all families and then you know, we don't have endless amounts of money here. So I'd like to see the funding target those at need rather than going to everybody. I understand this is gonna start with targeted, but uh, branch out from there. And then a uh, final comment is that I sure would like to see, I guess, more of those evaluations on the existing programs. And then let's put additional funding into those existing programs and perhaps tweak them to make them work better instead of starting a, another whole huge government program, which we tend to do this, I think, as legislators, we see a need, and then we, we layer and layer and layer all these programs, and pretty soon we don't have enough money for any of the programs. So just a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Um, just on the evaluation point, um, I guess uh, my understanding is that the programs that we use have to be evidence-based or in some cases what's called evidence-informed, but that although there may not be evaluation of the Minnesota application, that there is an evaluation and there's evidence that underlies the use of the programs. And if, um, uh, yeah, if we can have, and Dr. Dobrin, I see your hand raised, just give me just a moment. If, Ms. Mock, could you kind of comment on that? And then Dr. Dobrin, I'll certainly call on you then, but Ms. Mock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that is correct. The programs that are um, currently available in the state um, have to be either evidence-based or evidence formed or have a promising practice. So there are some evaluation requirements. And I do wonder if um, uh, MDH could maybe speak to that a little bit more. Oh, that's a good point. The Department of Health is, is on, um, and maybe Ms. Reckinger, I'm not sure, but um, perhaps if you could comment on that or whoever from MDH is on. Uh, Ms. Reckinger, I see you are, yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Representative um, Pinto. Um, Did you just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Find yourself to do. My, name, <laughs> my name is Don Reckinger, and I'm the manager of home visiting at the Minnesota Department of Health. And um, we do have uh, the what how Ms. Mark described it is correct. We have um, what we call sort of traditional public health nursing that happens. We have evidence-based promise uh, practices. 75% of our funding must go to the long term um, by requirements of either federal or, or state statutes. Um, Minnesota has a long history of funding um, community health boards, um, counties, and tribes with um, uh, sort of TANF allocation. That's where most of our short-term home visiting happens, but we're only reaching about um, five to ten percent of the state. Uh, and we do have a very comprehensive evaluation, which is voluntary on the parents' part. Uh, we track number of visits, we track what referrals were made, we track what screenings were done. Um, we did, we have 19 benchmarks that we look at and then depending how short the visits were, it just depends if they could get to all of those. But we'd be happy to do follow up information. And then there is one um, universal home visiting program that is implemented in the state right now, the city of Minneapolis and uh, the county, uh, Hennepin County are implementing Family Connects, which is a universal home-based program that starts at birth um, and uh, sees families for anywhere from like one to three visits. It's in very small Thank geographic areas. Thank you, Ms. Reckinger. Um, Dr. Dobern, if you were gonna come out, I'd need to have you keep it really, really brief because um, we've got some member hand question, members hands up, but um, did you have something you wanted to add about this? All uh, right, you can go unmute or. Yes, I, I just wanted to say that it isn't uh, people who need uh, uh, the type of services that uh, are currently provided and uh, that uh, Representative Morrison is advocating for. Uh, the people that need the most are not necessarily the people that know that they need them the most. And that's why universal screening is important. People bring their kids to the pediatrician for well child visits and the public uh, to the extent that it pays for uh, Medicaid and so forth pays for it. Everybody understands that early identification intervention is important. I think that's the uh, a key thing here is not everybody who needs it understands they need it and therefore targeting is is difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dobrin. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll note um, that, uh, and I said there were a couple of hands, they seem to have gone down. Um, 
uh, just represent Bennett to your to your point. Um, yeah, I work outside the legislature as a, as a prosecutor of, of domestic violence, among other offenses. But that's kind of been the, the heart of it, and that's an example of something where um, you know just that check in when somebody has the baby. And again, it's this is voluntary, um, but there are situations that people are in where there may be referral services that may have an impact on on the infant. Entirely voluntary, of course. Um, but that that may be something where it may not be obvious, as Dr. Dobrin says, that there's um, that there's a need based on somebody who's having a low income, that kind of thing. At least I think that's the that's the purpose. Um, I see Representative Wazalik has her hand raised. Representative Wazalik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, maybe for the bill author, or maybe for some of the other folks who have worked in the field. But I'm wondering, I, I sort of can grasp what it means to have a targeted home visiting program and how you would do outreach. But what does it mean? Um, in terms of getting folks enrolled in the program when it's more of a universal program? What would that process look like or how would those connections be made? I suspect it's actually simpler in that case, but um, let's see. Uh, one of our representative Morrison, maybe we'll start with you unless one of your testifiers has a thought on they want to share. Representative Morrison. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Wazlick. I, th I think it's probably best to let one of the, the people on the ground answer that question. People on the ground. <laughs> Somebody can please. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, Miss uh, Chandler. It looks like was unmuted. So maybe we'll go with go with her. Yes, um, Mr. Chair um, and Representative Wazowick. Um, so we do an incredible amount of outreach with all of our clinics and hospitals and our primary care providers, and um, we have. Um, them make the referrals to us also with the nurses um, who work um, with them um, because they're often the ones doing that work and and that's how we um, utilize a universal type model and then when we're doing more targeted it's um, primarily WIC um, or some of our early childhood folks but those are primarily how we receive the referrals thank you thank you and Representative Wozniak I see hands still up Representative Wozniak Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted clarification on that because I think to Mr. Dobrin, uh, Dr. Dobrin's point, like people may not know that they need the access to that program, so they may not think about it when they're when they're going to a clinic or something. But it's good to know that there is that outreach happening. Thank you. And I guess I would assume, Representative Morrison, as I said before, that that could be a lot simpler because all you need to do is, um, uh, you know, when when there's a birth, somebody checks in. Um, anybody need any help? Um, if it's a quick interaction, but it's not something where you need to do a lot of complicated outreach, just just can connect with everybody. It just simplifies things. You don't have to kind of have a whole detailed process. Um, and I see some nodding coming. So, um, and if we can just verify, um, this was an issue folks may remember a few years ago on our committee to just confirm this, this is entirely voluntary. Um, uh, if uh, Representative Morrison, is that is that correct in both these programs? Mr. Chair, that is correct. And I agree with you. Making it universal simplifies it dramatically. It becomes woven into the DNA of our state. Obstetricians and midwives and pediatricians will provide that information um, during the course of care. Uh, public health outreach will be a part of it. I think I agree with you, Mr. Chair. It's well, well put that it will, would actually simplify it. Okay. If I can ask Ms. Mock, if you could please just give us a comparison of these proposals versus the administration's um, proposal. And members may recall that we heard the presentation of that a couple weeks ago. Um, I think it was Mary Manning from uh, Assistant Commissioner from MDH. But Ms. Mock, could you just, just uh, fix that in our minds? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I should say, um, I'm happy to defer to Ms. Reckinger if she also would like to oh. speak to the, um, to the governor's proposal. Uh, of course, but yeah. The, the bills in front of the committee today, um, 3886 and 3887, um, as uh, Representative Morrison described, they established these, this universal voluntary home visiting program that focuses on providing visits prenatally and in the first four months of, of, of a child's life. Um, and the program is intended to be universal, available to all families in the state by June 30th, 2025. Um, as I understand the governor's proposal, there is also a universal component uh, where um, they would fund all births, all um, short, they would provide home visiting to all births for short term home visiting. So that would be providing one to three visits um, in the first uh, few months of a child's life. Um, but then the proposal would also um, fund evidence informed home visiting programs to serve uh, certain priority populations. And then also expand some of the long term home visiting programs um, that Ms. Reckinger uh, discussed. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what I'm inclined to do is, um, I think that's a good summary and I know we'll be, um, there'll be further conversations. Um, uh, I don't see other uh, hands up and so would like to um, move forward to the, to acting on the bills. And I'll just remind members that we've had a number of discussions Sorry, about Mr. home Care? visiting. Oh, pardon me. Yes. Yeah. Representative. Sorry, this is representative. Thank you. I'm, I'm on yeah, my please. phone today, so I couldn't raise my hand. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. Please. I, you have a question? Um, yeah, no, I just, I just wanted to um, uh, kind of express my appreciation for the uh, prioritization and inclusion of uh, families in foster care. And I think um, the universal registration process, I think that that certainly could help simplify. I think where some of the complication comes in is for infants who are um, moving into out-of-home placement directly from the hospital. So just wanted to, you know, um, encourage the, that communication there with the foster parents and, um, and ensure that if that child is dealing with any sort of um, uh, in utero drug addiction, um, that there's obviously the, the medical tie-in um, during the home, home visiting process as well as the encouragement uh, because uh, fostering obviously is um, is, a di is difficult um, in, in any situation, but particularly with an infant who is dealing with um, some sort of uh, physical challenges um, due to their uh, their time in utero. And I know that uh, Dr. Morrison um, is, is familiar with, with that process. So I, I think she's definitely the right person to be carrying this bill. Thank you, Representative Katiza Watoon. Yeah, and, and this and these bills will be heard in the health finance or, or be referred there um, for more discussion too. Um, so I'm not seeing other hands for discussion. So we're going to move to the formal uh, action part of this. So, uh, so Representative Morrison, uh, you are moving House File 3886 to be referred to the Committee on Health Finance and Policy. Is that correct? That is correct. And Mr. Chair, don't forget we have an amendment for each bill as well. I was just about to get to that. So uh, you, you will have an A1 on this bill and the other bill as well. So if you could please just remind us what the A1 uh, does. Certainly, Mr. Chair, the A1 uh, simply adds public health nurses to the list of healthcare providers that can participate in the voluntary home visiting services. Okay, good. Thank you, Representative Morrison. We heard a bit from, from Ms. Chandler about that as well. So members of the A1 amendment just puts the bill uh, 3886 in the form that Representative Morrison wishes. Any discussion to that amendment? I'm hearing none. So um, all in favor of approval of uh, the A1 amendment, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed to that? Okay, hearing none. So that motion passes. So we now have the uh, HF 3886 amended. Um, and we had an extensive discussion and questions and all. So I think we're ready to move on then. So uh, Representative Morrison renews her motion to refer House File 3886 as amended to the Committee on Health Finance and Policy. And so I'll now ask Mr. Doslin to take the role. Uh, Chair Pinto? Aye. Vice Chair Pryor? Aye. Lead Franzen? No. Lead Franzen, no. Uh, Representative Bennett? No. Holden? Aye. Representative Daniels? Representative Daniels. Representative Daphne. Daphne, aye. Representative Damoth. Damoth, no. Representative Jurgens. Jurgens, no. Representative Cotiza Watoon. Cotiza Watoon, aye. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Representative Waslowick. Waslowick, aye. And Representative Volgamont. Representative Volgamont. The resulting vote is seven ayes, two nays, and two absents. Okay, um, so the motion passes, and uh, HF 3886 as amended is on its way to health finance. And then now the other bill, um, Representative Morrison moves House File 3887 to be referred to the Committee on Health Finance and Policy. Is that correct, Representative Morrison? That is correct, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. And and we can if uh, you can just um, I can just confirm that this is very similar to 3886, but is time limited and and has a different name. Um, are those sort of the, the main differences between the bills or some worse? Mr. Chair, that is correct. And this one will be amend as amended with the A1 as well. Yeah. So you move the A1 amendment, I gather. Yes, sir. I do. Okay. 
And, and, and members, that amendment does the same thing as the other A1 amendment, so simply adds uh, public health nurses um, to uh, to the list of folks who can participate. So this just puts the bill in the form of some worse and wishes. So any uh, discussion to the A1 amendment, just as author's amendment? So hearing none, all in favor of approval of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that's uh, that motion passes. The A1 amendment is adopted. And so, again, we had a uh, big discussion. So um, moving back then, Representative Morrison renews her motion to refer House File 3087 as amended to the Committee on Health Finance and Policy. Mr. Dozen, if you can please take the roll. Uh, Chair Pinto. Aye. Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Pryor. Aye. Lead Franzen. Aye. Representative Bennett. No. Representative Arf. Bolden. Yes, well. Bolden, aye. Uh, Representative Daniels. It's real. Daniels votes no. Uh, Representative Daphne. Daphne, aye. Representative Damoth. Damoth, no. Representative Jurgens. Jurgens, no. Representative Cotiza Watoon. Aye. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Representative Waslowick. Waslowick, aye. And Representative Wolgamot. Wolgamot, aye. The resulting vote is eight ayes and five nays. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Doslin. So uh, the motion passes. House File 3887 as amended is referred to the Committee on Health Finance and Policy. Thank you, Representative Morrison, for advancing it and two dust fires. Um, I need to give a particular thank you to Laura LaCroix de Lune. I don't know if she's still on. She is um, on vacation, but had um, but was calling in. Um, we felt the need to move these bills quickly to get them into the hands of uh, the Health Finance Committee um, and really appreciate her. Um, She's on vacation in a nice place far away. And so especially appreciate all of her work uh, and certainly today and all the testifiers as well. So um, thanks so much. So moving on then to our final bill, uh, House File 3859, uh, Representative um, Bolden moves uh, that bill to bring it before the committee. Um, uh, is that correct, Representative Bolden? That is correct, Mr. Chair. Okay. And um, uh, let me think, uh, why don't you describe the bill, uh, if you can, briefly, and then we'll have you describe your author's amendment and we'll move to your testifiers. Yes, very good. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members. I'm glad to be here today with House File 3859, which is part of a broader set of immediate workforce initiatives being brought forward by ARM, the statewide trade association representing residential service uh, providers supporting people with disabilities. Uh, so what is before you today is a, is a piece uh, of uh, a broader bill. Um, so the growing statewide workforce crisis has uprooted every sector of our economy and the disability services are no exception. Recent news stories have highlighted a Rochester area uh, provider's difficult decision to close 10 homes due to lack of staff, causing 30 individuals to need to find alternate alternative services. Unfortunately, site closures and programming changes like this are becoming far too common. Similar news stories in Duluth, Moorhead, and throughout the Twin Cities help to illustrate the critical situation people with disabilities find themselves in. One major barrier staff have reported as a reason they leave their role as a direct support professional or DSP is the growing cost of childcare. And that is uh, something we've had many conversations on this committee about certainly. Uh, the current average wage of a DSP is just over $14 per hour, and with child care costs ranging anywhere from $200 to $400 per week, many staff simply just cannot afford to work. Uh, so House File 3859 would create a year-long grant program for DSPs that would offer monthly payments to help offset the cost of child care and in turn incentivize staff to remain in their profession. Uh, so with me uh, to provide more detail on the bill is Phil Griffin, representing ARM, and Stacey Rowe of Mainsail Services. And uh, happy to describe the amendment if now is the appropriate time to do that, Mr. Chair. Yeah, well, why don't we do that, Representative Bolden? Let's uh, let's get the bill in the form that you wish. If you can just say what the A1 amendment uh, yep. does. Thank you. So yes, the A1 amendment would just put the bill in the shape that I uh, would wish. It uh, will... Um, it will hold uh, recipients of this grant program harmless to not have those that additional one hundred or two hundred dollars a month um, count towards um, you know making them not eligible for other public uh, services such as MFIP or or the like. We don't we want to help folks. We don't want to have this extra money cause them to not receive other services. 
Um, uh, sounds good. So we have the A1. Um, and so uh, you are moving the A1 at this point then. Okay. And so members, uh, you heard, the, dis heard uh, the description of it, just putting the bill in the form that author wishes. Uh, so not seeing any hands or discussion on that one. Uh, all in favor of approval of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Okay, so that motion passes, the bill is amended, and then let's move to your testifiers. So Mr. Griffin, I think you're up first, and if you can please um, uh, uh, go identify yourself and proceed, <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Phil Griffin. I'm here this morning representing ARM. ARM is a nonprofit association of more than 200 provider organizations, businesses, and advocates dedicated to leading the advancement of home and community-based services, supporting people living with disabilities in their pursuit of meaningful lives. As Representative Bolden shared, the bill before you today, House File 3859, is one piece of a broader workforce initiative that ARM is bringing forward to the legislature this year for consideration. At a recent hearing, Commissioner of Human Services reported that in 2021, 90 people in total needed to find alternative housing due to group home closings. Just two months into 2022, that number has already reached 59 and is rising rapidly. These services are closing due to a lack of staff and families are scrambling to find alternative options for their loved ones. I cannot emphasize enough, disability waivered service providers are no longer facing a workforce crisis. They are facing a workforce catastrophe and we need to help need the help of the legislature to find solutions that will retain the staff that we do have and bring new staff into the profession. There's no one single action that will fix this problem. This morning, we are asking you to consider this bill as one of several actions the legislature can help enact to help in a small but important way. House File 3859 creates a grant program that will assist direct support professionals, DSPs, with the cost of child care by providing monthly payments of $100 for one child in child care and $200 for two or more children. DSPs are more times than not the lowest wage earners in their household. When someone is forced to stay home and take care of their children due to the lack of affordable child care, it is our DSPs that are forced to leave their profession. We want to thank this committee for their consideration of this proposal to help ease some of that burden, support our staff, and allow them to remain in their profession. And Mr. Chairman, thanks to you and the members of the committee for your attention to these vital issues for Minnesota's disability community. I would like to turn to the next witness, one of ARM's members, Stacy Rowe. If there are other questions after her testimony, I'll remain online and would be happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Griffin, thank you. Thanks uh, for your work. And actually, as you showed on the other bill, you work um, in all kinds of important areas. We really appreciate, appreciate that. Um, so Ms. Rowe, let's have you go if you can identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Bolden, and committee members. My name is Stacy Rowe, and I work on the executive team at Mainsall, and I'm also a member of the executive committee at ARM, and I'm really grateful to be able to speak with you today. Mainsall offers supports and services to people who have disabilities and need assistance at home, at work, and in the community. Of our 600 employees in Minnesota, over 400 are direct support professionals. There are approximately 30,000 direct support professionals in Minnesota, and I want to acknowledge all of them for the incredible work that they do. Direct support professionals assist people as they navigate their lives, supporting people with typical daily tasks like showering, cooking, and cleaning, as well as complex and skilled tasks like medication administration, using communication devices, and implementing person-centered and indiv individualized proactive plans to ensure health and safety, address challenging behaviors, and support people to achieve their goals. While the decision to stay in or leave the workforce is something working parents have to choose based on what's important to and for them, with the current and rising costs of childcare, combined with the realities of direct support professional wages, parents who work in direct support services today are not left with much of a choice. The simple math is that the average cost of full-time childcare for more than one child is greater or equal to their take-home pay. It is not feasible to work as a direct support professional and have children who need care too, unless you have other sources of income or access to free subsidized or reduced cost childcare. And part of why this matters is that our state has thousands of direct support job openings that are not getting filled and demand for these services is increasing rapidly. While the worker shortage is impacting almost all industry, this isn't a coffee shop or even my bank that closed early the other day. A shortage of this extent in home and community-based services impacts where and with whom people live and can become a matter of life or death. 
which is why when a provider doesn't have enough employees, they can't just close early. Many are making the heartbreaking decision to stop providing services altogether or reduce the number of people they support to match the workforce they have. If that wasn't bad enough, it often means a person has to uproot their entire life. Imagine having no choice but to move, live with new people, and have new people supporting you with your most intimate of needs. No one wants this to be happening, and I'm asking for your help in taking action to stabilize the direct support professional workforce. Let's show people that we value them in word and in deed by offering the incentive of childcare relief grants to these essential workers. It just might be the reason some parents choose to stay in the field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Rowe. Um, so um, members, we are, I think, ready to move on to questions. I see we've got Representative Wozniak's hand raised. So Representative Wozniak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I wanna just thank Representative Bolden for bringing this forward. Um, one of the top issues I've heard about um, from constituents is the, um, the workforce shortage in our, specifically in disability services um, with um, different facilities closing and people just not being able to find um, work uh, folks to help support and care for their loved ones. So thank you very much for bringing this forward. Um, I do have one question. I'm wondering how the amount was settled on. Um, I feel like $100 seems like not a lot. So I'm just wondering if, if what those conversations looked like and how that amount was, how, how folks came to that amount for this grant program. I see the author unmuted. So we'll start with Representative Bolden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative uh, Waslowick, for uh, your comments and for the question. Um, I'll start, and then I'll certainly open it up uh, to testifiers to uh, chime in if they would like as well. But I think, um, uh, you know, wanting to have a, an amount that is meaningful and and useful uh, to families, and certainly, you know, as we have had uh, conversations, as I said in this committee, about the just the equation of childcare just does not work for families and and um, uh, so wanting to have a meaningful amount balanced with, uh, you know, what is possible, as was said, there, there are thousands of DSPs across the state. And so, um, you know, I think it would be great, you know, I support, uh, uh, you know, mechanisms to, uh, to fund uh, early care and learning for, for little ones in, in every way. Uh, this isn't going to solve all of those problems, but will be a piece of the puzzle. And so balancing with sort of what is possible uh, with what is meaningful and, and Certainly, if others would like to chime in. Yeah, we'll let um, Mr. Griffin, I see you, please. Mr. Chair and uh, Representative also, I don't think there's any magic to the uh, number that we put in there. Um, I'd love to say that we did a very careful study, uh, but I have to admit that we are really trying to throw things at the wall and see if anything will stick. Um, as I said, uh, we are beyond a workforce crisis. This is really in catastrophic uh, territory, and you heard the coverage of uh, the Rochester Post Bulletin on closings that was on CCO News last week. Uh, here in the cities, it's happening all over the state, and we're just trying to find anything that we can do to try and help our DSPs. And this is part of a broader, Representative Bolden had, had alluded to this before, it's part of a broader bill, and maybe Mr. Griffin or Representative Bolden, you can tell us that, that bill number um, that is now in human services. Um, and so kind of, I think there's a lot of things that, that are being attempted to address this crisis. And this is one part of it. We got the one part because this is in the com our committee's jurisdiction. Um, but Representative Bolden, I saw you'd unmuted before. So please. Uh, I will have to look up that bill number, Mr. Chair. Okay. So I can do that now. <laughs> Apologies. No, that's fine. No, no, no problem. Mr. Griffin may have it. But I guess just for folks to be aware, though, that this is one piece of a bill that's currently in human services. This people piece will remain in our committee because the funding would come out of our committee. Um, the rest is there. Um, I was like, I saw your hands back down um, and not seeing others. I guess I just wanted to, to note. Oh, Mr. Sure. Griffin, please. If, no, please if you're looking for file numbers, we have House File 3268. We have House File 3100. We have House File 3163. They're all part of uh, this process that we're trying to get increased payments into uh, the DWRS system, try and do away with some of the unnecessary problems that we have in uh, regulations. And uh, the child care is another piece of that stool. Uh, we're trying to keep all the legs going. Thanks. Yeah, sure. And for those who are not native uh, HHS speakers, um, DWRS, a disability waiver rate service. Um, uh, and so, and I guess I just want to observe that um, this bill, to my mind, really brings to a point, um, you know, you have a group of workers, Ms. Rowe really described eloquently the critical work that these uh, direct support professionals do um, and how just extremely squeezed they are. Um, in our committee, we talk a lot about 
of folks who provide early care and learning services um, uh, and how they're, it's a very similar situation. I think if anything, it's possible that wages are even lower for child care providers than for folks in this area. But of course, it's incredibly important work. Um, so in a way, this really, to my mind, really shines a light on this intersection of the workforce behind the workforce in the form of uh, the child care providers and supporting our direct support professionals who allow people to live in dignity. Um, so a lot of need out there. Um, just looking to see if there are other questions or comments uh, that members um, have. Um, uh, and I'll just I'll just note for um, uh, yeah for for those who work oh, in this DSP area um, that we're trying to address broader the broader child care and early learning crisis um, uh, of which this is just one piece. So okay, uh, so Representative Bolden, you were the bill's author. You have the final word. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, committee members, for uh, having us before you today. And just uh, would ask for support and and just uh, again to DSPs out there uh, would echo just a, a thanks for all the work that you're doing and and realizing that this is one one piece of the puzzle. And as we are trying to uh, work towards solutions, so thank you. Okay, good. Thanks very much. Uh, well, not seeing anything else, so. Uh, uh... Uh, the chair lays over uh, House File 3859 as amended uh, for possible inclusion in a committee budget bill. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Ms. Rowe and, and Mr. Griffin, uh, for your important work allowing folks to, to live in dignity. Um, we really we really appreciate that. So members, uh, we are just about to wrap up. Just a reminder that on Thursday, we'll be hearing the governance report that we had, uh, had requested last year um, from Minnesota Management and Budget. Uh, again, I'm sure you have your well-thumbed copy of the report. You're just diving in deep into early childhood governance um, uh, uh, nerdery um, and uh, be prepared for that. Um, we'll also have a presentation on kind of um, uh, uh, how governance efforts are, are happening, what's going on in some other states, uh, even beyond the report, um, which I'm excited for. So not seeing hands, questions, et cetera. So um, thanks so much to members and members of the public. We'll see you on Thursday morning. And with that, our meeting is adjourned.